so welcome back. Um, our next and final session of today will be on education. If we are to meet the global challenges, you notice I'm not wearing my glasses, I've realised I can read the, 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 the fonts without my glasses, so much better than gazing over them like some headmaster. Um, if we are to meet our global challenges, uh, we need to think hard about how we educate the next generation of engineers. Pioneering schools, universities and charities are starting to re-examine some of the fundamental concepts of engineering education. And our expert panel includes some of the leading figures in this drive for change. Education is a theme that I think cuts across the other topics of this summit. Uh, so in recognition of that, the format of this session is slightly different uh, from the previous ones in order to allow more time for uh, a discussion, a Q&A with the audience. And I know we've been sort of squeezed uh, a little bit in the, in the, for the other sessions. So we'll hear a keynote speech followed by very brief introductions by the other panellists and then we'll launch straight into the discussion. So, our panellists for this session, and, and I'll, I'll, if you don't mind, I'll read them in the order that I have them here, rather than the order they're seated, but you can, I'm sure you can recognise them all. So, uh, first of all, it's, uh, it's very nice that Will I Am has agreed to join us for this, uh, for this session uh, and be involved in the discussion. Um, then our keynote sp uh, speaker is Professor John Hennessy, who's uh, President of Stanford University. Uh, Professor Damon Dowling, Head of the Department of Engineering at the University of Cambridge. Dean Kamen, at the far end there, uh, founder of FIRST, a charity which aims to inspire young people to become science and technology leaders. Robert Matheson, principal of the STEM Early College High School, based at North Carolina State University. Uh, and Professor Chris Wise, co-founder of Expedition Engineering and professor of civil engineering design at University College London. So I would like to invite John Hennessy to come and deliver the keynote speech. Thank you. Engineers invent the future. They are the ones who will help us find the solution to the global challenges we face around the world. The grand challenge for engineering education is to attract the best and brightest young people to go into this field and then prepare them to make the kind of contributions that we will need to have a sustainable future. But there are a number of challenges. Many students simply don't know what engineers do. There's no exposure in K-12. They learn math, they learn science, but they don't learn much about engineering. And the classical engineering approach, lots of physics, lots of math, and if you survive it, maybe you get to do some real engineering. It turns off too many people. Women and minorities drop out at twice the rate in the US. Modern engineering education needs to be problem and project based. It needs to be creative. It needs to be collaborative. It needs to be global in outlook to really reflect how the real world works. And it needs to be inspiring. Many students really don't know what engineers do. Engineers used to run trains, but today they do something very different. You turn on TV. You can find out what lawyers do, what doctors do, what police detectives do. You can even find out what politicians do, at least while the press is around. <laughs> but you can't find out what engineers do. I remember a few years ago, I was lecturing to a small class group uh, from a local school that was visiting. And I was trying to inspire them about what engineering could do. So I said, well, how many of you use Yahoo? Well, most, a lot of the hands went up. I said. You know, Jerry Yang, the guy that started that company, went to this university. They look like this, and finally a hand goes up and he raises his hand. He goes, did Shaq go here? <laughs> Shaq is, of course, the American basketball star, getting to Will I Am's key point here. I said, no, but Tiger Woods did. <laughs> Jonathan Cole, the provost at Columbia, has documented why society is so ignorant of the role of engineers. He surveyed the major history books in use in US high schools and discovered that in the typical history book, there were more pages about hippies, drug culture, and the Beatles than there were about the internet, the telecommunications revolution, or the computing revolution. Engineers are the masters of complexity. 
This is old time complexity. Here's new time complexity. Cell phone. To make this smartphone operate, there are over 10 million lines of code between the base station and the phone itself that have to work. And believe me, how angry do we get when the phone doesn't work? We get very angry. 10 million lines of code that has to work. Teaching engineers about how to master these complex things is a critical educational role for us. Engineering creates better infrastructure. It solves really complicated problems. Take the high-speed train system here in Europe. The trains are moving so fast that an engineer cannot see a hazard where a train has stalled in time to stop the train. It is physically impossible to stop that train in time. Only through a complex set of electronic signals of software that has to work for that train to move forward can things really work. Look at the channel. I think if you told people 30 years ago you were going to build a tunnel under the English Channel and it would work and it would work reliably, people wouldn't believe it. You've got to make it work, you've got to prevent accidents, and you've got to change the world with this kind of thing. Of course, infrastructure is part of what may, has made our lives better, and engineers are the ones that create complex infrastructure. But engineers also work on sustainable problems. And I think we heard earlier the importance of trying to teach sustainability and get the sustainability gene injected in young people. Well, it's absolutely crucial in engineers. And here I agree with what Jeffrey Sachs said. Of all our sustainability challenges, energy is front and center. If we don't solve the energy problem, the other ones won't matter that much because our planet will be in deep doo-doo. That's a technical term, of course. So what are engineers doing? They're bringing new creative solutions to it. Techniques using nano, uh, nanofibers and nanowires to try to dramatically increase the battery density. Imagine a factor of 10 leap forward in energy density. We'll all be driving electric cars. We could all drive electric cars, not just those that can afford Teslas that cost $75,000. All of us could drive electric cars. Or imagine if we could get a real breakthrough in thin film solar technologies so that solar cells would be much easier to install and much easier, much cheaper. That would again change our world. Engineers work on these kinds of problems. Getting students involved in these kinds of problems early will inspire them about what engineering can do and get them thinking in a sustainable fashion. Engineers collaborate. They collaborate a lot with doctors. Doctors don't invent all these technologies. Engineers collaborate with them. Of course, one of the greatest I innovations in terms of reducing healthcare costs and improving outcomes is the balloon catheter, a collaboration, fundamental collaboration between engineers and physicians. On the other, in the other picture, you see an emerging collaboration using the ability to read brain waves to help a patient who's been paralyzed. This young woman was able to uh, control a robotic arm to get a drink of water, something she hasn't been able to do for herself for 10 years. And what's fascinating about this is it's deep engineering. Unlike a system where the individual has to train the robotic arm and learn how to train something different, in this system, the brain waves are actually interpreted in their natural state. So thinking about moving your arm moves the robotic arm. It's deep signal processing and deep analysis of how the brain is working that leads to this kind of thing. Collaboration is a critical ingredient, and it's critical that we teach it to our young engineers. Engineers improve the quality of life. They innovate, and teaching that, getting that innovation gene deeply established in young people is critical to their success as emerging engineers. Whether it's tablets and cell phones, or Stanley, the self-driving car, Stanley was really a breakthrough. In the previous years, the DARPA Grand Challenge, the longest ride in the car, the car had been able to go no more than seven miles, and that was on standard roads. In the DARPA Grand Challenge that Stanley won, the car drove 133 miles on a combination of conventional roads and desert roads that were not paved. It finished the race by going up something called Beer Barrel Pass, a climb of about 200 feet with sinuous curves on it and no guardrails. I wouldn't have driven on the road, but Stanley did. Stanley fused together lots of different innovations, new sensing technologies, multiple approaches to finding out where the road is, and clever use of machine learning. 
And this is where the kind of innovation really comes in. One of the most difficult things for an automobile to do is driving down the road and it sees a dark patch on the road. Now it has to figure out whether that dark patch is actually a big hole in the road that it has to avoid or simply the shadow of a tree that's cast across the road. Easy problem for people, difficult problem for a car interpreting those signals. But that's the kind of innovation that we need as we move forward. Many students don't know what, who, what engineer, who our engineers are. I look at this picture. This is an old IBM advertisement, but I love it. Uh, if I go down to Silicon Valley and I compare this picture, in this picture, these engineers are too male, too white, there are too many ties, and they use obsolete computing equipment. <laughs> it's important that engineers see themselves as doing cool work. The coolness factor is a critical ingredient in getting young people into engineering and exciting them about their education. If young people don't see other people in the field that look like they do, they have a hard time sticking it out. Engineering is a tough discipline. It's not easy. It's challenging material to master. Figuring out how we do a better job of that is absolutely crucial. One way to do it is to make it more people-oriented, to get engineers working on problems that they see changing people's lives. That certainly inspires people who want to make a difference in the world and who want to see their career as oriented towards helping people. It's also critical to build teamwork skills. Computer science is a discipline that has an interesting story to tell in the United States. Early on as a discipline, there were actually a reasonable number of women in the discipline. Then, in the 1980s and 90s, as the discipline grew by leaps and bounds, it attracted far more males than it did females. And today, it has a dramatic imbalance. Of course, things like video games and a video game culture contribute to that imbalance. But we have to think about how we turn that image around so that we're attracting the best and the brightest young people, wherever they come from. Many students simply don't know how engineers work today. They have this image of sitting in a cubicle. In fact, I was teaching a course a few years ago, and I had a number of young women who were considering going into computer science in the course. And they said to me, well, the problem is that guys would sit with a bag over their head and their terminal and their, just their computer in there, and you just have to slip food under the bag and they program all the time. <laughs> and this young woman said to me, I don't want to do that. So what did I do? I took her down to Google. That image uh, you see on the left is from Google. Uh, that's the way Google works. There are no two-person offices. They're mostly offices of eight to 10 people. There's lots of common space. There's lots of interaction. There's lots of collaboration. Big engineering problems are not solved by lone wolf approaches anymore. They're solved by collaboration and team building. How, some students see engineering education looks like this. The only difference between this and a modern classroom is if you took a modern classroom, you might have a little more gender and ethnic diversity, and you'd also have all the laptops open. But if you went in the back of that large lecture hall and looked at those laptops, you'd see Facebook rather than class notes was running on them. We've got to do a better job of educating our students differently. We've got to integrate them in different approaches. And we've got to help them think about the importance of science and mathematics as underlying disciplines for engineering. But we've got to put some design first. We've got to put problem solving at the center of it. Engineering education then has to be project-based, collaborative, and multidisciplinary. But of course, we also have a wonderful new thing that's happened with the online revolution. It was only 18 months ago that three Stanford faculty decided on a lark to take their courses, put them online, and make them available to the entire world. In 18 months, MOOCs have become a major phenomenon. But we've also, while we're very much in the experimental time and we don't understand a lot of things about MOOCs, one of the things we really do understand is that they're going to change the world. And I think they're going to do that in three ways. They're going to help us educate the rest of the world. And I'm afraid, since Lady Gaga's songs sell for 99 cents, Jeffrey Sachs' lectures are not going to sell for 99 cents. 
He's a nice guy, has important things to say, but he's not Lady Gaga or Will I Am. So it, it's, it, it's going to be free. Um, <laughs> secondly, we are going to have to figure out how to bend the cost curve. While access to education, high quality education, is a big problem in the developing world, in the developed world, cost of education and its effectiveness are the big problems. We have to find a way to help improve productivity without decreasing the cost of the educational quality. And that's our challenge. How can we use these kinds of technologies to improve educational quality? Well, we can. We can make them more interactive. We can make them adaptive. We can do more self-pacing so that students with different skill levels can move through course material in different ways. And of course, we can deliver it any place, any time. Engineering education should be inspirational and should be available to the entire world. Thank you. Thank you for joining us here this afternoon. Thank you very much, John. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned at the introduction, we're just going to have uh, a brief uh, few words from each of the other panelists. Why don't we mix things up and start with, with Chris at the end there then? <coughs> yeah, yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah. So I make sure you're awake. A little, a quiet little snooze. <laughs> right. Um, are you in? <laughs> just got a minute for this. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just, there are a thousand things you could say. I'm going to say two. Firstly, I'm going to try to clear up the distinction between engineering and science. Science being something that starts out there and you bring it back into your head. Engineering being something that starts in here and goes out there. It's 180 degrees opposite. Science is very useful for engineering, but it is not engineering. And that's the first one. The second thing, who, who is going to practice engineering and how can we uh, develop their skills so they can do it really well? And the, um, a slightly alternative take on that is the method that we use at UCL and was actually developed by um, work with the Royal, Royal Designers Summer School with filmmakers, photographers, fashion designers, people like that, which is to, instead of saying you're a mathematician or a hydraulics engineer or whatever, say there are three strategies for engineering. The strategy of the artist. The artist is somebody who pursue, pursues interest. The strategy of the artisan. The artisan is somebody who looks at what's been done before and tries to make it slightly better. And the strategy of the philosopher being somebody who looks for purpose and meaning. And you, you don't have to be good at all three of those to be a really great engineer. You can be good at one of them, or two of them, or if you're lucky, all three of them. The artist maps to the conceptual part of a project. Uh, the artisan maps to the analysis, testing, the sort of rigorous um, subject of an objective type world. And the philosopher maps to judgment. And you only build your project if in your judgment the concept that the artist came up with, which has been tested by the artisan, actually works. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> Robert Matheson. Thank you very much. Uh, a real honor to be here with you today. <clears throat> I guess you could say this is the ultimate elevator speech. Oops, lift speech. Uh, I'm, I'm learning, I'm learning. Um, so let me give you some key points here. Um, I, I'm the principal of a school in the second year. We have 110 students, 9th and 10th grade, <clears throat> and we're a STEM early college high school. So you have two concepts that are, that are married together there. But there are three real fundamental foundations, in my opinion, and I think you've heard uh, these words, you've heard these concepts all throughout the day, so it's really affirming to me because I'm at the high school level, and I'm hearing <clears throat> what higher education is saying, I'm hearing what the business community is saying. Um, you start with the curriculum, and the curriculum is based on the grand challenges for engineering. So when I saw that, as a former researcher and former science educator, I had an aha moment. Because if you're going to create a school in the 21st century, there's really no better way to get at this STEM type of school uh, than through the grand challenges for engineering, because there's something in there for everyone. It's life science, it's earth science, it's physical science, it's chemical science. And so this is a way that you can tie these grand challenges to each of the sciences that we teach on, in a given year. So for example, we teach earth science in the ninth grade. Well, obviously we have selected access to clean water. And so this interdisciplinary approach is not only 
<clears throat> you're studying access to clean water and the scientific principles related to earth science, but you, and there's also an engineering design class attached to the earth science. So for the engineers in the audience, we teach engineering design in grades 9, 10, 11, and 12. Engineering design attached to every science class. <clears throat> but it doesn't stop there. Um, you hear sometimes people talk about STEM education. We teach a lot of science. We teach a lot of math in what in education we call a siloed approach. And we actually heard that word today, I think. Um, but it doesn't stop there because really the grand challenges, the 21st century issues that our kids need to resolve, it's about economics, ethics, legal, political, social, sustainability issues because that's where the application is going to come from. Not that we don't need more research and innovation in STEM, we do. But that's where the problems are going to be solved. <clears throat> the other major piece, uh, uh, Dr. Hennessy, Professor Hennessy talked about project-based learning. We are a project-based learning school. We don't lecture discussion. Uh, the kids come in, meaningful use of technology. They've already done the reading. They've already looked at the lecture, listened to the, watch the YouTube, watch Will I Am, because I know he's got a good one out there. Um, <clears throat> and then they come to class and they work on activities and projects. And the teachers circulate, and they go individually, or they go to a small group, or they stop the whole class and say, whoa, we're on the wrong track here, talk for 15 minutes, let's get back to work. Then the last piece would be what I call whole child development. And so a uh, Socratic seminar, which is nothing more than a thoughtful, respectful discussion, uh, facilitated by the teacher, not led by the teacher. The kids do the talking. Um, college readiness, so these collaborations, soft skills, self-advocacy, time management. You have to teach students how to do this because if they don't have this when they get to college, they're in trouble. And then the last piece is career exploration. So anywhere from uh, career uh, guest speakers to job shadowing to internships after their junior year, uh, they will do a graduation project in their senior year and their super senior year is the fifth year. Uh, so we, we really tie career to education. Um, when you think about educating engineers, the place to start is what qualities do you want in your trained engineers, in your graduate engineers? And to me, the primary aim of education is to develop creativity and communication. As Chris said, what distinguishes engineering from science is instead of just studying the world, the engineer changes the world. And to do that, you need that creativity, you need that invention. When big projects go wrong, they don't go wrong because someone couldn't analyze the stress in the beam or know the second law of thermodynamics. They go wrong because of lack of communication, because the team doesn't communicate, because they're not pulling together. So those are really the skills that we want undergraduates to develop. And I believe that's done primarily through project work, sometimes as part of the curriculum, sometimes because the students just want to do big projects just for the sheer hell of it. And that's what education of engineers um, should be trying to uh, develop. Local to the UK, and it's from John's been describing, it's the same in the US, we don't have as many engineers go, students going into engineering as industry needs. In fact, within the UK, the graduate engineers only represent half the number that industry wants uh, to employ. Um, and not all those engineers go into industry anyway. So there's, there's, there's a big gap between supply and demand. And getting that message across that if you really want to make a difference in the world and you want to get paid pretty well while doing it, engineering is the um, career uh, to choose. Um, some students have heard it very well, but it's not universal, it's not wide enough, and I think we'll all be talking about later about various ways of getting that, that message out. I'd just like to end, if I, I may, with, with one topic which I think is global, because this dearth of engineers is certainly not global, and when one talks to Chinese colleagues, of course, they're in a completely different framework, where engineering is the uh, course to take, and even... Every successful politician will have come from that kind of background. Uh, but a real global element of education, I believe, is that if we are to see some of these transformational solutions to global grand challenges, 
that we've been hearing about today, and I'm sure we'll hear some more tomorrow, there is an element of education for society as a whole because there are big decisions, there are discussions to be had around the kind of futures that we want in the world. Whether it's futures about the size of the population, the size of individual families, or about the introduction and regulation of new technologies. These aren't discussions just for engineers and scientists. Everybody needs to be able to contribute to that discussion about what the world should look like. Politicians, of course, but society as large. And that means actually everyone having an element of education that is sufficient to uh, uh, engage in these futures. Thank you. Now, I don't know, Will I am, did you want to s add a few words? I mean, you've, 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 you've maybe said your bit, but... <laughs> um, yeah, I would like to add a few. Hello, where's my mic on? Hello? No, it's not up. One, two. Hello? Not yet. Okay, yeah, okay, cool. things. <laughs> Thanks, Dina. Got a mini mic. Um... In my world, I get called from corporations, politicians, for my ideas. And at Coca-Cola, I pitched an idea to them around sustainability to take their waste and turn it into a commodity. And that turned into EcoCycle, where it takes all their waste and creates a base cloth and then license that base cloth to other companies to execute their sustainability efforts. Um, and because of that, now they have, uh, they have eco centers um, with team came in water purification systems. Um, and it, it changed internally Coca-Cola. So the CMO, B. Perez, is now the CSO. Chief Sustainability Officer, she's the person that I went to meet to present my eco-cycle concept to them in 2009, and that changed Coca-Cola internally, created a whole new department. So the other day, around uh, in November, I was campaigning for Obama, and he was having a speech in, new, uh, in Ohio, and it was around... Um, you know, he's talking about STEM education. It's like, how are we going to pay for it? How do you have you? How do you have first programs in every school across America? Because to me, that's the solution. STEM is a great concept, but how do you apply it? So when I went to first and I saw the kids building robots and competing, I'm like, wow, that's the application. But how do you pay for it on a global scale? I mean, in a national scale in America, and if, you know, when, when U.S. When first is in every country. So I was like, wow, how America can actually consume its way. Consumption is actually the solution. Because when you, you know, the only thing that didn't, well, you know, fall apart in our recession was tablets and smartphones. It didn't like Apple went under during our recession. We all bought new phones and computers and televisions. Consumer electronics was healthy in the recession. So I was like, wow. So as he was doing his speech, I had this vision. So after his speech, I said, hey, Mr. President, I have an idea for you. He said, well, let me hear it. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, the concept is called STEAM certified. And here's what it is. Every Consumer electronic products has a tax on it, but we don't know where it goes. Now, if the consumer is able to aim that tax to schools that are transparent online, they become a STEAM certified citizen, making that product a STEAM certified product, making that company a STEAM certified company, creating a social aimed currency. Now, what's social aimed currency? Well, it's points around consumer electronics. So in theory, it would work like this. I buy a tablet. That tablet, I'm able to aim that tax to 
Roosevelt High School. That tax, because I'm aiming it, I have to double it. So now I'm aiming the tax by doubling the tax, and it provides Roosevelt High School, because I aimed it that, to that school, with tools, U.S. First, in Roosevelt. First, if they have this program in Brazil. <clears throat> and then I would get points as a citizen to, right, to utilize other STEAM like, um, items, flying to Hawaii, because it, it takes STEM to make a freaking airplane go to Hawaii. <laughs> Staying at hotels. People think STEM is everywhere. It's just this new little slogan we're throwing around. STEM is everywhere you go. It's medicine. If I don't have a family, a friend, uh, a family member, a friend who who's sick that doesn't have health care, well, I could give her some of my STEAM certified points. So he was like, I like that idea. Talk, that work, cold talk. So then I met Todd, um, and we've been working on trying to get it going. So I was like, you know, instead of just waiting for politicians, let me go to my folks that I know at Target. Because Target always wants commercials. So I'm sitting there with the CMO. I'm like, hey, you guys should have a STEAM certified program and start it with a store. Retail. Consumption is the solution if you apply it to STEM. You can't just say STEM and not say consumption. So I just want to share that little idea with you guys, figure out how you guys, you can help me do that STEAM certified thing. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Dean, when you're hooked up again, you should make it. Am I hooked up? To work as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, to be fair, I think I ceded most of my time to a guy that's way more credible at pointing out that we have to collaborate with a much broader world than each other. I mean, everybody said it. We had the president of Stanford University point out, you got to make it relevant. We heard a superintendent of a high schools, the principals say, you got to make it project-based. You heard every speaker on this panel and this morning, the, the, the signs that are hung in this room say uh, it's about collaborating. Uh, and these are three national academies. National Academy of Engineers in the United States. To me, it's been one of the most prestigious organizations I could imagine. The Royal Academy. I mean, every famous physicist I think of. I would have liked to have been here when Newton was around. But anyway, a Faraday isn't bad. And now you have the Academy of Sciences of the country of China. We could say that's collaboration. I'd argue that we're dealing with 14 grand challenges that affect every human being now alive and presumably going to be alive soon. 14 incredible issues. The three organizations that arguably will have more impact on life as we know it than anything else out there. And this meeting is virtually a secret. Collaboration shouldn't be between all the people that know how to sing to their own choir. I was excited that Will was going to come here because I'm thinking he can say with personal experience, yeah, when you go to the Oscars, that's an Academy Award. But it's not held secretly so that Steven Spielberg can quietly tell some famous actor or actress how wonderful they are. It is not done that way. In fact, it's done for exactly the opposite reason. And when they have the Grammys, I think you got a few of those. They didn't do that secretly in a back room somewhere where all the people that make, produce, or sell music get together. The world needs inspiration. It needs role models. It needs to see people having fun, doing important things, being successful, and to obsession, mostly due to technology, uh, the world of entertainment and the world of professional sports have leveraged that to the point where all kids everywhere know who all the big, exciting, important athletes and entertainers are. The unintended consequence of that is we've pushed out of their consciousness when they're kids, when they need to learn things, that they've got to work harder at developing the muscle hanging between their ears than bouncing a ball. Now they get to 18 years old, and if they're one of the five best ball bouncers, they'll be Shaq, and they'll make tens of millions of dollars. If they're the sixth best ball bouncer, they have a pretty marginal skill to go through the rest of their life with. It's our fault. He said it, but 
This group of academies needs its collaboration to include the rest of the world. We need to inspire kids all over this world to take on these challenges because there are a lot of them and we can't do it alone. I think you all get an A+. Plus. I can't get up in the morning thinking I'd rather do anything but try to solve engineering problems. You get an A+, plus doing what you do. I think we collectively create the basis of modern civilization and make it possible. And I know you're all busy. You keep all the stuff that the rest of the world takes for granted. You turn on the tap, the water's drinkable. You flick the switch, the lights come on. You get in an airplane, you don't expect it to lose its wings on the way across the Atlantic. The world takes it all for granted. If the basketball player can get it in more than about 40% of the time, that's great. They expect you to get everything right all the time. And you mostly do. And they're very intolerant when you don't. So you get an A+. I don't want to seem negative. But I think we collectively get a D- in having a responsible voice to the six billion people that are counting on what we do. And then, as he said, it's our fault that we don't get recognition, support, and more people. I was, everybody here talked about project base, and Mr. President, you used the words collaboration, project based, relevant, fun, and inspirational. That's what FIRST does. I'm not here to pitch FIRST, I'm here to give it as an example of the fact that given the right opportunity, particularly women and minorities around the world, almost more so than the rich kids, because they see it the way they see sports and entertainment now, except ours is a real opportunity for jobs for tens of millions of people. Sports and entertainment is not. But I'm here to say that if the collective engineering societies of the world decided to work with people that are experts at communication, at entertainment, and could help make it relevant, project-based stuff. I mean, all of learning to me is project-based. I started a business at 14 making stuff for my older brother who was in med school. Everything else I do in life, I've got 400 engineers that work hard. They don't work hard at the second law of thermodynamics. They're using the second law of thermodynamics to build the world's most efficient ways to make clean water. They don't use Maxwell's equations to see that they can solve them for boundary conditions. They use them so we can build electronics. That's st it's, it's project-based. And kids learn by projects. We take it so much for granted, you'd laugh if I gave an example, but kids don't learn football, soccer, by spending the first 12 years in school learning the rules, getting quizzes, defining it. Yeah, give them a soccer ball when they're a little kid or a football. Life is project-based. The only thing that isn't is engineering school. It's the only thing. We gotta fix that. And we gotta fix it starting with little kids. In a free culture where you get what you celebrate, we've got to start celebrating what you do. Not among ourselves. We know how cool this stuff is. We know how important this stuff is. We should have the Academy Awards here, the same way he has Academy Awards. And at the end of it, the world should be part of the process. Thank you very much. Wow, well, as a theoretical <laughs> physicist, I've never felt so useless. <laughs> I solved Maxwell's equations. We used to need you. We used to need you. <laughs> I, I've done my bit. I'd rather, my son, rather than following me into, into physics, he's, he's uh, studying to, to be an engineer, so I'm, I'm, I'm doing my bit. Um, so between now and 5.30, we have, I think, plenty to, to discuss. Um, I, some of the issues, uh, how to inspire the young, so the sort of the, the stuff that Dean and Will I Am were talking about. Um, uh, how do you make engineering cool? I mean, Robert talked about engineering design, and I think, you know, the, the, I, I love Will I Am's idea of putting the A for art into STEM. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that, you know, that, as you say, Apple products are cool, uh, but, you know, think about the aesthetics of, of, of engineering design as well as the, the applicability. And then, of course, I think Anne's point about, you know, we don't have anyone from the Chinese Academy uh, on the panel, but, you know, how come in China and India there's no problem with inspiring young people to go into engineering, and yet in the West uh, there is? So plenty to, to discuss, and I'd also like it if you, if you could sort of tie in what we're discussing now in education 
and link it with some of the other uh, stuff we discussed in the earlier sessions on, 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 on health and, and so on and sustainability, that would be great. So, okay, lights are up, um, show of hands and we'll get the roving mics round. Uh, okay, so gentleman there was probably first one to... Well, we've got plenty of time, so we'll come to you. <laughs> yes. D down there, down the bottom. Yes, yes, thank you. And someone from this side? Give someone with a hand up. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, my name's Dave, so I'm running with Clemson University. And some years ago, I interacted with the Star Trek producers and tried to get them to produce an episode or include in one of their movies what the future of engineering and science education might look like to give a hopefully successful example. <clears throat> they didn't take it up. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm wondering what you, the panel's thoughts are on eliminating really the tedium of mathematics from engineering and science. Now, I know that it's controversial probably, but for example, uh, today we, we have software that can solve partial differential equations, they can do integration, and instead have students understand physical concepts, you know, like what, does Maxwell's, what do Maxwell equations actually represent, uh, Newton's laws, and you know, and so that they can interact with the computer as a tool and then take away, as John Hennessy was saying, some of the intimidation uh, that exists. Is, is it time for that? Who, who would like to? Um, maybe, maybe a little controversial, John. Yeah. Well, well uh, look, you have, to, you have to know enough mathematics to know whether what you're plugging in a calculator or in the computer gives you a, an answer that makes sense or not. But I think you can learn much of that in the context of solving problems. We started a new course this year. It's one of our introductory courses for freshmen, open to engineers, scientists, everybody in the university. It's called The Science of Mythbusters. And the professor takes, in 10 weeks, 20 different Mythbusters shows. And then, before the experiment is done, they sit down and try and work out what the likely outcome of the Mythbusters experiment is. And again, it's, celebrity makes a big difference, I think. They got the Mythbusters, Mythbusters guys to come at the end of the course. The students had a great time. And they could work out problems, thinking like an engineer, thinking like a scientist. I think So they're using mathematics, but they're working in a problem context. And that's what we should be doing more of. I could add to that yeah. uh, from the high school level. I've had several conversations with math teachers, uh, and they tell me, Rob, I can teach you how to solve a differential equation, but then if I manipulate the variables, manipulate the factors, and ask you to draw or on the computer or whatever kind of artistic, creative way you want to ex explain, tell me what happens. We can teach kids how to do the mechanics of math, but it's about the learning. It's about the understanding, because when you get to the higher level mathematics, when you get to the calculus, a, B, C, 102, 9, 11, however far it goes. I'm a science guy, so I don't know how far it goes. Um, but that's really something that we're concerned about. That's why at the school we block our math. In, in North Carolina and the United States, we have block schedules where kids will take a full course in 90 days in one semester. <clears throat> we block our math, and so it, it allows us to get our kids through close to pre-calculus by the time they're sophomores. And if they want to stop there, then they can, but a lot of kids are going to go on to NC State University coursework with their math, the pre-engineers, the pre-vet, and then so on and so forth. So it's important that we give the kids the full math because that is the language of STEM, in my opinion. So I would be very careful. I think we would be remiss in kind of glossing over and dependent on the computer in terms of we would lose the thinking piece. And aren't we into teaching our kids how to think and how to solve problems? And here, this is how it's changed. Describe to me what happens next. Okay, so Dean, then Chris, then Ann. <laughs> so to tell the truth, I'm more of a physicist and a mathematician than I am an engineer. I didn't realize that's a problem. Um, it just says we need so few physicists to keep engineers busy once you give them a couple of basic rules. But anyway, um, <laughs> I think it's almost taking too easy a, a shot at saying, well, it's, it's the math that's a problem. It's a math that's difficult. And saying, well, it's a price you have to pay. I think math, mathematics is the intersection of the natural world and the invention. You know, is two-ness or three-ness or five, is that discovered or invented? 
The fact that you look at Euler's equation, e to the i pi is minus an irrational transcendental function raised to an imaginary power with a little bit of trigonometry in it is one. The fact is, mathematics, to me, is one of the most beautiful, logical understandings that we've created. And to say, well, they don't really learn that is like saying here in London, well, we just want Shakespeare to write beautiful stories, but having words and vocabulary, he doesn't have to learn that stuff. I think math has been taught by that analogy, bring in Oxford's dictionary and every day be tested on how do you spell chrysanthemum? How do you sp Learning the rules that kids can learn at home and look up, how do you solve the differential, second order, inhomogeneous equation, oh, separation of variables. You don't need that. They can look that up. But don't take the cheap shot of saying math is either difficult or unnecessary or boring. It is the language of logic and of thinking and if presented well, which is very hard, it is a beautiful subject. And once you understand it, you understand the rules of the world. You can make relationships between things. Engineering itself becomes both more beautiful and I think easier to do. But it says that like other things that are project based, we have to make understanding the conceptual business of mathematics real. I, I guess to be fair to the questioner, he probably meant that you know, some of the underlying mechanics, machinery of maths can be incorporated into software, Stephen Wolfram type, you know, you know, where you can learn about graphs and gradients without actually having to do the programming that underlies it. But, uh, um, okay, so I think everyone would like a, would like a, a say. Chris, yes. you're next, uh, and then they'll come to you. Yeah, quick one, because I, uh, there's far too much mathematics in engineering education, I would say. I would rather have one top mathematician involved in my project than half a dozen rubbish ones. And, and I think we're churning out fairly rubbish ones, frankly. So I would like access to a really top one, if it, whether that's somebody in the team, somebody in my office, somebody that's not even a human being but is a robot inside a computer. I don't mind where that person is, but I, I think basic numeracy is important. And I utterly agree that the beauty of the, of the systematic logical framework within which the physical world operates is something it's really important for engineers to know about. Whether maths as it's taught at the moment is the right way to do it, I, I, I think probably not. So, and the point, the real point I wanted to get to was to say, uh, as you alluded in your question, that we are, much of what is currently co uh, called engineering is going to be done by robots in the future. And I think, well, I am made the same point. Engineers will become appliances in 20 years time. I think they are already appliances in certain instances, but unfortunately they're still human beings in many, situa in many cases. <laughs> and I think it's really important, if you're going to decide which bit of mathematics to include in an engineer's education, that it's balanced with the things that are really important to engineers. So synthesis, integration, collaboration, humanity, ethics, things that are really important when you're trying to grapple with some of the questions that um, we've heard about earlier on today. I think the bit of mathematics that's really important to engineers is the link to the physical world. Mm -hmm. Actually, how the maths link yeah. and how through those links you make conclusions and move on uh, to, to uh, produce the results that, that uh, the, you know, the, the new devices or whatever that you want. So, to me, it's really important that maths isn't taught in isolation, perhaps not taught by mathematicians. In my own department, we make a real emphasis on making sure that it's engineers that are teaching the maths, because then they can set everything in context and they can actually show what understanding comes of the physical world uh, through the mathematics that the students are learning. And that's what's then motivational, actually doing something with it. Here's where we check your mic. Yeah, it's on. Good. <laughs> so I'm not a mathematician, but I appreciate um, math. The thing that I, worries me about uh, where we're going as a culture is you know, music is hard right? to understand the fundamentals of music. It's hard. It takes discipline, especially if you come from the ghetto. It takes discipline to stay focused so you're on course. And so is math. It takes discipline. And when I, when I, I met, I'm, my travels, I met like, great mathematicians and great scientists. And I asked, how long did it take you to learn all the things you learned? He said, about 12 years. I said, wow, that's how long I've been doing music. It took me 12 years. 
So what I think we need to do as a culture is to make math and science and make it sexy for, a, it sounds funny and silly, but you have to make, we have to reimagine how it's taught. So a kid from the ghetto has, looks at math as survival. You cannot discredit the survival skills it takes for somebody in some favela, some ghetto, or some slum to survive. And, they, and, and it's sad that the things that they lean to to survive just so happens to be destructive things. Because the other things that are more you know, appealing as, as it relates to bringing the world together are difficult. And we didn't make them sexy. We have to make now with tablets and these new ways of looking at complex problems and bringing the arts in. Arts are important. So the marriage of art and science, art and math, there wouldn't be no music if, it, if you didn't marry art and math to create music. But we don't even look at it as math anymore. We just call it music. So math is important and we have to make it sexy. Thank you, okay, next question. Uh, Ipshida from Cambridge University. Um, I felt at various points during the day there was a definition on what is engineering and what it is to be an engineer, uh, where some argued as engineering part of science or if engineering is opposite to science. But I wanted to argue when you're talking about making engineering cool, should engineering be a, a, a value or a frame of mind which is, which is which any citizen can take upon in a way that just as music or sport, as anyone can, can pursue that, engineering projects or DIY projects, it's, it's approachable to everyone. It's not just because it's another degree. You don't need to have an engineering degree to be an engineer. Anyone can be an engineer. Obviously, I'm not downgrading uh, the importance of an education in engineering, but it needs to be more approachable for the common man. So what does the panel think about that? So maybe for Part of popular culture as well as a vocation and a career. Who, who would like to add to that? Well, I am. <laughs> <laughs> the marriage of engineering and art, you know, musicians corralling and, and, and be, becoming a cluster inspires other people to want to become musicians. Collaborating and making songs, a saxophonist and a, and a drummer. Wow, what is that? And, and a pianist creating new forms of music called jazz. But, in culture, we don't have engineers creating art to where a young kid says, hey, I want to be an engineer too. What's the entertainment around engineering? There is, it exists, but unfortunately, it falls in the hands of entertainment and then we take what you make and we call it our industry, right? So we take Nikola Tesla's ideas and Marconi's and we have radio. That's some engineer, that, that's science. We have a Grammy Award. That's somebody's hardware. Now it's ours. So you have to do entertainment and art around engineering and salute those that engineer and innovate and they become tomorrow's Michael Jordans, tomorrow's Lady Gaga's. And I'm saying that as an entertainer, right? I'm putting myself out of business with that statement. <laughs> <laughs> but it's needed because that sustainability is where are we going as a culture? I'm concerned. Don't we have a global music entertainer at every science engineering conference <laughs> no, from now on, I think? <laughs> get much better at that. <laughs> Dean. Making it relevant to kids. I'm not a sociologist or psychologist. In fact, I always thought some of the soft sciences are a little soft. Um, but we started with our high school level competition, which I thought would inspire kids to want to be, quote, engineers, namely problem solvers, but problems in the realm of using mathematics, using electrical, mechanical systems controls, as opposed to political science around the problem. I think I try to make engineering a relevant set of problem solving skills to give you exciting careers and solve world's problems and make yourself happy. Prove that you could do it with these projects. As we started going younger and younger with the kids, we finally got down to little kids and we used Lego bricks. In all the competitions, you would win two-minute rounds by getting more points. 
than your competitor. It was almost all guys, and winning points was good enough for them. When we made the game for the young kids, it was still almost all guys. We couldn't figure out why girls wouldn't do it. And then instead of saying, well, you've got to pick this up for two points and got to get off the field in three points, we said, those are the whales. You've got to save them. That's the toxic waste. And instead of calling them points, they were looking at world problems. At this point, we are overwhelmingly seeing girls on the younger teams. They just have a more developed brain at a young age, and points aren't enough to keep them busy. <laughs> they need to do things that matter. And engineering matters. And they need tools. And if you explain to people that engineering is nothing but a powerful set of tools that allows you to solve problems that you simply couldn't solve without it, you'll put in the effort to learn all those tools. Okay, I've got a question here, then up there, then the lady down there, then I'll go to a Birmingham question. I'll just give you an idea. From Rice University, one of the things that uh, I was quite taken back and, uh, by and kind of occurred to me just during this meeting is the uh, entertainment for E. I think most of you have heard of TED. The first time I heard of TED, I thought it was technology uh, education and design. It's not. It's technology entertainment and design. What a, a curious combination. Well, it's actually not so curious. So this idea of, an, of the academies, having an Academy Award, well, the TED talks have become worldwide. And the TED organization has become where They have done something that I, I thought would have thought was impossible. The academies, the three academies here, should consider what TED has done and see if there is some way they could kind of lever off of that and make themselves more relevant, more popular, and I think more accurately described to the public than we've done in the past. Uh, Dean, would you comment on that? <laughs> I've taken too much time, but I, I, violently, I violently agree with you that it is up to the technical community of the world. Every generation has to give the next generation their vision and their focus and their purpose. And shame on us if we let the future be defined by a narrow group of people in a narrow set of industries. Uh, they'll all grow up to be politicians, lawyers. A few of them will be basketball players and a few of them will be entertainers. That's not a sustainable way to solve the world's problems or give career opportunities to seven billion people. John, did you want so to So I just say, but look, what TED does is it explains key insights very simply. It tells a story about what an innovation is. We need to do more of that. Why have we had such a hard time with climate change issues? Because we either we're in two modes. We either are over the top about explaining it, or we start pulling out a set of differential equations and probability curves and talking about all that. We have to make it simple. We have to say, would you take all your net worth and bet it on one roulette number and take that chance? And of course, most reasonable, most reasonable people will say no. And then you say, well, that's, that's the game we're playing. You need to translate it to ordinary terms. And Ted, I agree with you, Ted does a great job of that. Thank you. Yes, question up there. Hi, um, I'm Chad from Duke University, and this, I'm just wondering, Dr. Um, Hennessy, um, what are some, I'm just wondering what are some ways that we can incorporate online education into a more um, hands-on, um, project-based style of learning? Yeah, so this is a really good question. Um, we're, we're in the infancy of experimenting with online, and I think there are two things that I think are just going to happen that are incredible. We're going to improve pedagogy by leaps and bounds, leaps and bounds. Because imagine, you put an online course there, right? These are interactive. You watch 10 minutes of lecture, then there's a quiz question. Now you've got 10,000 students doing the course. Guess what you find out really quickly? If 5,000 students can't answer the first quiz question, then that section of the lecture was probably pretty crummy. So you begin getting feedback at an amazing rate. Every single keystroke, how long it takes students to answer a question, all gets collected by the computer. One of the interesting experiments we've done is an online course that's an entrepreneurship course taught to students around the world. We even had an entrepreneurship team in Iran composed all of women uh, doing this course online. Um, and, it, and it uses lots of new technology. So we do crowdsourcing for feedback. 
So what do you do when you have 10,000 students in an entrepreneur? Well, we had 30,000 in the entrepreneurship class, right? In teams of six, there are 5,000 projects. How are you possibly going to read them and give them feedback? You crowdsource it. So everybody, in order to get their project read, has to read six other projects and give feedback. It provides a great way for empowering the learning community now to learn in new ways. It's not going to replace small seminars with lots of hands-on and Socratic dialogue, but I think there are ways to do things that simply wouldn't be doable otherwise. And, and that's where we're going to liberate that technology and really take it. Okay, so question there. Hi. Um, my name is Philip Bang from the University of Birmingham, and I'm part of an organization called Engineers Without Borders, which some of you, I'm sure, are aware of. Um, in terms of diversity in the gender balance, EWB has a much more even spread between girls and boys. And I feel that education can come in a number of ways. So we've mentioned the media. And on Friday, Comic Relief starts, which to the Americans maybe you don't know, but it will have hundreds of images flashing up on the screen showing us the suffering in countries and how we can help. But the only way we're asked to help is by giving money. Why is there nothing out there that's saying, we need engineers, where are the engineers rather than the money? Ooh. Who, who, would, who would like to talk? Chris. I'll just, I mean, just reply, um, start, start to reply by saying we, we ask our um, first years in engineering school, doing civil engineering, which is actually, it's about a 60-40 split men to women at the moment, so a much higher proportion than you get in practice, why they're doing engineering. And um, about a third of them say uh, they want to be bankers, um, about a third of them say they really like taking things apart, and they tend to be blokes, <laughs> most often European blokes. Uh, and a third of them say they want to save the planet, and they're usually the women. And um, what happens thereafter is they, they appear to be gradually processed away from that um, aspiration into one of Victorian um, macho... Uh, I can do a big thing. I have a big thing. You know, it's that sort of thing. It's, it's, rather, um, it's rather unfortunate, and it's a real turn-off, for the, especially for the women, and actually for the more sensitive blokes. And I, th I think that there's a, uh, a cultural problem. It, the language that is used in engineering schools and in engineering practice is totally negative language. Stress, strain, failure, collapse, <laughs> misery, you know. <laughs> And not only do we say we want to... You actually hear people say, we're going to design for collapse. You think, seriously? I want, to be fan I want something fantastic. I want, a I want a beautiful thing. I want something absolutely gorgeous. I want something which is going to help people. And, and so instead of celebrating success and say we're going to achieve success, we say we're going to avoid failure, avoid failure. And we're conditioned further and further down this channel of saying it's a negative thing you're doing. Don't get it wrong. And that is, I just think... I don't know, I'm not a woman, so I can't speak for the, the, the female sex, but for a sensitive man like me, I, I <laughs> really feel disenfranchised by most of the engineering education that I see, and that's why I'm in it to try and change it. Um, oh, so Anne, well, you're <laughs> as the woman on the panel, maybe, <laughs> yeah, obliged to say something. Well, I don't know about the UCL students, but I think even the men on our course actually do want to make a difference. I, I, I don't think that... that I mean, it would be nice to say women had, the, women had the monopoly on that, but I actually don't think that is the case. I think many students are actually motivated uh, to do good, and, and they actually gravitate towards relish courses that are about sustainability, about energy, ab about bioengineering. Um, and, yes, we have a very successful EWB, and, um, you know, I, there are a lot of women on it, but a lot of men as well. And they're hugely motivated by just, um, you know, the things that they do, the eco-house, things of that sort that they're working on. Um, I actually think that the students we have these days are very caring of the world, really, um, and see engineering as part, part of that. Robert, I wanted to ask you, what, what is it like at your high school, I mean, the, in terms of getting <coughs> girls involved? I would say a couple of things. Um, first of all, again, we're in our infancy, we're in our second year, and we're developing those ties with North Carolina State University. There are 12, 15, 18 groups that are just waiting to become mentors for our kids. So I think we're going to see more and more of that role modeling, the mentor-mentee 
uh, which is a very, very popular. When you look at the research, you, you have high school, you have college, and then what's the link between high school and college? Frequently, it's a practicing engineer, 40 years old with two kids. Well, for a 14, 15-year-old, maybe they don't have that connection, but if you have that North Carolina State University student making those connections, and if it's a woman or uh, somebody of a uh, ethnicity that is underrepresented, uh, then you're going to be able to make that connection with the kids. Um, another thing that we're seeing is there is a Women in Science and Engineering Club at NC State. They're doing outreach. And I can't tell you how many times I've had young ladies in the school after one of the sessions with the wise ladies from NC State say, you know, I didn't realize that's what engineers did. I think I can do that. And so I think that's just going to promote more and more women and ethnic groups getting involved with engineers without borders and maybe it be not to be dominated by, by males, but I, I support what Ann says as well. I, our school, our entire school, I mean, the kids are engaged by the hook and the relevance of the grand challenges for engineering. They, they get that because this is their world that they're going to be growing up in. It's going to be their kids and their grandkids that are going to have to deal with the issues that we don't resolve in the next 30, 40, 50 years. So I really see that. I, I think that there is a relevance right now in a school that adopts the grand challenges for engineering. And again, we're young. Um, we're doing a six-year study through North Carolina State University to get at, are we changing attitudes and behaviors with especially women and minorities with respect to STEM? And I would predict my hypothesis is yes, you're gonna see a difference. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm, I'm aware there's something like more than a dozen hands. Oh, so, so, double that now. Uh, we have 20 minutes left. Uh, what I want to do is quickly go to our audience in Birmingham. Birmingham, I haven't forgotten you, um, who asked a question which I think is, uh, it will help lead the, the discussion uh, for, the, for the last remaining 20 minutes. Uh, it's to, and, and it's actually addressed to the, the, those who are the engineers on the panel. So I guess Chris and Anne, um, you class yourself as an engineer? I was when I checked. They, well, then, then <laughs> I've fine. been president too long. I think. Oh, exactly, that's why I have you forgotten. Well, the, 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 the question is this. Um, what or who inspired the panel to continue with engineering despite engineering school? <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> uh, it's a very good question because I, I don't think I would have been an engineer. I virtually changed to doing medicine. Um, and I, met a, I had a mentor in the third year. It was a three-year course in those days guy called Peter Taylor, who was the engineer for um, the fabric of Salisbury Cathedral, which is something that had been looked after by Christopher Wren when it was 300 years old, and it's now 800 years old. And um, he took me around Salisbury Cathedral and showed me how you could take a pile of stones and turn it into something just totally amazing. And, um, and that it wasn't an accident that, that human beings could do this, and that the people who actually did it and understood how to transfer these enormous forces through this beautiful system were engineers. And as a result of that, I changed my mind and decided that I was going to do engineering. It was, it was the, that example. I think probably without that, I would have given it a miss. Thank you. So, science guy. Science guy, good man. And would you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to confess here, actually, my first degree, my, my undergraduate degree is in mathematics. Oh, well, okay. But then I saw the light. <laughs> <laughs> you survived that, Anne, so after that. So, um, uh, and uh, what motivated me uh, to do uh, then a PhD in engineering was a big problem. I wanted to make aircraft quieter. And it was at the time when Concorde was flying, so there was a really big challenge to, uh, to, to, to step up to. Um, of course, now my, my decision would be completely different. And I'm not sure it's such a hurdle these days because when I look at the courses students do, there's just so much project work and actually having fun uh, that I, I think, um, well, I never got that in maths, but I would certainly get it now in engineering. Good. Uh, for me, it's simple. I always loved computing, and to support what Dean said, I love the mathematics behind <laughs> computing, really. And it doesn't have... You, you talk about decidability, what can and can't be computed. It's not a really physical concept, but it's, it's incredibly intellectually beautiful. And so, and I, I love that. And I, I could have, you know, I was an undergraduate as a double E, but I switched to computer science. I tell my students today, you couldn't get an undergraduate degree in computer science when I went to school. They don't believe it, but it's absolutely true. Uh, and that got me excited and kept me going. 
Thank you. Well, yeah. since the question was actually essentially, did you overcome the education system and still be despite? An yes, that's right. I can tell you, um, maybe for the first time, proudly, um, something that everybody at, at my little company uh, knows. Uh, I always tell people I spent the best five years of my life as a freshman at engineering school. Um, I, I, I never got to be a sophomore. I never got any credits. And when I quit, I was a second semester freshman, but I had spent five years there. And I think I got a better engineering education than any of the people I was going to school with. Um, I paid tuition the first time, and I went and I saw those big lecture halls that you put up, wow. pictures of and made fun of. And I thought, wow, this is like 13th grade. It's really awful. And I was already running my little businesses, and I needed to learn. Solid state stuff was getting better and better, and I needed to learn about digital chips and other things that I needed to learn about to make my stuff better in the mechanical engineering department. There was a lot of stuff there. And for amusement and the beauty of it all, I loved math and physics. And I thought of this campus as nothing but a target-rich environment of really smart professors that get interrupted by having to teach courses they don't really want to teach uh, <laughs> between doing their research. So I said, I'll just hang out where they do research. I'll ask them questions. And a few of them will be too busy for me. And a few of them won't be very smart or passionate. But like every bell curve distribution, I'll find some really smart people here that will teach me what I need to know as long as they see that I'm earnestly trying to learn. And I spent five years getting myself an education there and left and figured if I didn't get enough of an education to get on in life without a union card, shame on me. Uh, I, my business did just fine. And uh, I mean, I've got 400 engineers, many of whom graduated as valedictorians or number one at MIT and Stanford and some of the other local trade schools around the country. And uh, uh, that's uh, I got a few from Oxford and Cambridge. I think some students can do really well in an academic environment despite the structure of it. No. Some can't. But getting an education, particularly an engineering education, I just would continue to restate, should be made relevant and exciting for everybody, not the gifted at academics. So, so I'll bet you, Dean, most people would say the most important things they learned, they didn't learn in a classroom. Right? They learned them on a project. Maybe they learned them on a really tough homework assignment. They learned it, they learned it on a project. They learned it outside a conventional classroom setting. And I think that's a good lesson at how we should think about our education. Thank you. Okay. Well, I think in order to cover as many, uh, come to as many people as possible, uh, maybe, and put the onus on you, the questioner, could you pick a panelist to address the question to? And we'll have just one panelist answer each question. I've, I can only keep four um, locations of people in my head at any one time. So the first one I was coming to was up in the, uh, in the gallery. Hi, Samantha Yang second. from yeah. Olin College. Professor Hennessy, I know that during your conversation you said that engineering education should be given to the best and brightest students. And the best and brightest right now are the ones that make it through this education system that we have. I was wondering if, I guess the general panel, but Professor Hennessy in general, um, to start, at what age do you think engineering education should start, and how does that fit into the bigger picture of just education in general? Well, by best and brightest, I mean, I, I'm not sure the best and brightest always make it through. Sometimes the best and brightest give up defeated by the education system or don't even get attracted to engineering. So I, I think what I would say is, look, science and mathematics are the foundation for engineering. And I think we don't, we, don't want to, we don't want this picture that says science is over here and engineering is over here and they don't meet, right? It's a spectrum, a continuum. So I, I think what's key here is trying to introduce what engineers do to introduce the problem solving skills. Those are just as useful if you're a scientist as they are if you go into engineering. So we ought to be introducing those more in high school and getting kids excited about. And don't see math as something where you simply solve problems that nobody really cares about, but a tool that you use to solve problems that people really care about. That's the kind of change we need. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. My name is Nick Cooper, and I'm a design engineer. And my question really is a bit of a statement. In a lot of our major companies, if you go into them and you ask them about their quality engineers, some of the major CEOs can't even define who their best engineers are. And that's a problem, because if in our own industry, 
we can't see them. How can we expect it to be visible in the outer world? So I think what William is saying is vital. Um, but the other thing is we're talking as if engineering is you go to university and you, that you get a degree. And we're forgetting that engineering is a spectrum of delivery. So really, when I'm talking to, to the, uh, the, the people from the universities here, engineering design is delivered by an artist with an idea. Um, you get the theory side who've gone to university. But there are intuitive people who don't, aren't academic, don't go to university. And some of the best engineers I've ever met are those intuitive engineers. We mustn't forget them in this conversation because engineering isn't just delivered by graduates. That's a very good point. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so lady in the far corner there, yes. Alison Guerin from the University of Toledo studying bioengineering. My question is more for Professor Wise. You mentioned earlier about the different learning styles or strategies of the artist, philosopher and such. And I was wondering if you think it'd be beneficial to, you know, find out early on what type of engineer perhaps someone is so that we can customize the learning and maybe get them, they can get the most out of their education and, and application of that. Yeah. That's a really, well, it's, very, it's a very perceptive um, suggestion and it's very hard to bring about. But we, we actually run a test with our first years, uh, which is slightly tongue-in-cheek to see whether they're artists, artisans or philosophers, uh, more to illustrate the fact that there are different approaches and to say when you're thinking about working on a project, have a go. At, if, you, if you have an artistic tendency, try and find a few philosophers and a few artisans to work with because you're likely as a team to be better balanced. And um, I think that there's a, there's a, um, a tendency to, to then take that far too seriously and imagine that you can only do a project if you have one of each. But actually, most, most teams morph on real projects, they morph from needing an artistic contribution at a particular moment to a philosophical one. Uh, um, to test them, I think, would be too much. I think to, to encourage people who have an artistic tendency, who are not perfectionists, who, are, who just like to experiment, or people who are looking for purpose and meaning in life, uh, but maybe not necessarily that creative in that sense, I think that you need to, that would um, encourage people who are fr uh, from a broader spectrum to actually consider engineering as a profession. And if they did, we'd end up with a better um, balanced engineering profession rather than people. We have far too many analysts, not enough synthesists, and I think that it's basically a shortage of artists and philosophers, too many artisans. Thank you. Yes. Now, my question is uh, for Dean Kamen. Uh, I'm, this will be regarding the scalability of uh, the hands-on uh, question that were asked, how can you have hands-on education for engineering? Uh, can you, you have done some wonderful things with robotics in the first program, but uh, people are sitting at the computers and controlling a robot just a few meters away. But how about doing this uh, maybe a continent away and even uh, temporal barriers? Is it possible to have more hands-on projects that students can do via the internet and also the robotics? So first of all, after beating on everybody saying it's our fault, I should clarify, I really believe engineers in particular are artists, and I'll get back to that in a second, and they have to be creative to solve problems in different ways than have, they've been solved before. But scalability really worried me with first, because people live with that myth, you know, the joke, of, uh, an outgoing engineer is a guy that looks at the other guy's shoes when they're having a conversation. And people said to me, if you want mentors to mentor other people's kids, kids that maybe are very disadvantaged, because I ask big companies to adopt schools, not where the yuppie executives live, but around the country where there's barbed wire around their factory and there's barbed wire around the high school next door. And I was told, you're not going to get engineers. They're busy. They're not going to do this. We had started with 23 teams in 1990, and the next year we had 50, then 100, and we've had 55% compound. This year, in January, we handed out kits to 23,000 schools in 64 countries. We have 93,000 volunteer scientists and engineers as mentors. 
We have 3,500 corporations that recognize the importance of making these projects available to save these kids, and deep down they know they need these kids more than these kids need them. And the fact is, engineers just never had the right format. They didn't do things where you celebrate and you cheer and you bring the school bands and you bring the cheerleaders. You get quizzes and you get tested. In sports, you get a coach that's nurturing. In engineering school, you get a D and you're told you're dumb. No wonder. <laughs> you know, and then they justify, by the way, in public schools, well, we justify sports because, well, they learn teamwork. Well, if teamwork's so important, why, when they do it in a classroom, do you call it cheating? <laughs> the fact is... <laughs> The, the fact is, the fact is, I love the engineering community because give them a format where we make engineering fun and make it comprehensible to kids. All we did is take real engineering and make it a microcosm. You can't take kids to Boeing and say, learn how to build a wing. Well, first you've got to learn computational fluid dynamics. You can't take them to a pharma company. First you've got to learn computational biology. You've got to make the engineering as simple as bounce, 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 throw. You make baseball into t-ball. You've got to make engineering real but short and intense and relevant like their attention span. Then you need world-class superstars to inspire them. We've done it. And it is so scalable that we have more of a problem getting into the schools to get the teachers liberated to do this after school, get the math and science teachers available, than we have trouble getting really world-class engineers willing to mentor kids. It is entirely scalable. We just need a little more attention to bring it out there. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, go to a question from, uh, from Birmingham before I come back to the audience. Um, the cost of engineering education is prohibitive in developing countries. What can we do to address this challenge? I think it's very important that engineering is one of the more expensive disciplines to teach. MOOCs will set you free. They will do it. Watch. Watch what's going to happen. There will be lots of content out there. Now, you'll still need hands-on presence, because you're not going to eliminate that. You're going to need a hands-on presence. But the content creation part of it, it's going to happen. And look at how many millions of people have already taken these online courses. It's going to happen. It's going to change the way, especially in the developing world, access to education. And it's going to help educate the educators by providing them with material they might not have access to. Forget about old textbooks. Right? What are textbooks? Textbooks are a way of reinforcing that large lecture that you were busy looking at Facebook instead of watching the lecture, right? So textbooks go away. Textbooks become online courses. You want to rewind it, you want to reread it, boom, you do it. Thank you. And I yeah. also STEM certified the concept of consumption um, and aimed, socially aimed currency being a solution yeah. for people to purchase things that are made via engineering and then aim the tax that's on it to specific areas that need uh, then there's a shortage of engineering classes, especially in inner cities. And uh, colleges playing a role in identifying the top engineers, just like uh, basketball drafts. We sit there and we watch the basketball draft on ESPN and sports channels and football drafts. Every year somebody gets hired at Google and Facebook and, and Boeing and Lockheed Martin, but they get, they're invisible. We don't know when they get picked up. There should be entertainment. We should go and perform at a draft when the engineer goes to it. I'm, sounds funny, but you're not doing it, and the basketball draft is. Google, Facebook. Thank you. Okay, I, we may have a um, slightly longer than anticipated in this session because we're waiting for the science minister to arrive. And surprise, surprise, he's running a few minutes late. <laughs> so, so we'll we'll keep going until I I, I find out otherwise. Um, so. Question next there. Yes, thank you. Hello, my name is Jenna Carpenter from Louisiana Tech University, and I'm chair of the steering committee for the National Academy of Engineering Grand Challenge Scholars Program. I just wanted to make sure people here were aware of the program. Uh, the goal of the program is to try to get undergraduate students to engage in the activities and experiences, including projects, that they need to be prepared to solve the grand challenges, including research, interdisciplinary curricula, which include the liberal arts and STEAM, entrepreneurship skills, understanding of the global dimension, and service learning. Um, in my day job, I spend a lot of time trying to recruit more women and girls to engineering and science, and I would guarantee you that this program really does speak volumes to them. Uh, at the K-12 level, uh, for example, Robert's doing a K-12 approach to that, which we also have a K-12 program. So we would love to expand it. We have 12 institutions in the United States. 
We would love to expand it to more schools. We do need more support. And we'd be thrilled to talk with our partners in the UK and China about it, uh, implementing it there as well. Thank you very much. Well, I, I, I gather the science minister is here, so we're going to go to our two final questions. <laughs> I do apologize to everyone else I have come around to. Gentlemen there, and then a question up in the gallery. Uh, my name is William McGarry. I'm a chemical engineering student from the University of Southern California. My question is for uh, Mr. Matheson, but I guess really anyone on the panel. Um, my love for science and engineering started at a very young age, which is what inspired me to be an engineer really before I even knew what engineering was. Um, I'm curious, how do you think we can get young kids or kids at an early age to develop these math skills, get parents to teach math similarly to how they teach students uh, or their children to read at such a young age so that these math skills that are necessary for engineering aren't seen as a hindrance, but rather um, students are excited to get into engineering because they're so adept in math. I think you have to develop model schools. I think you have to have something to look at so that when you go back to your school environment, K-12, we'll say, uh, you can look at your strengths, you can look at your needs, and then you can match what you've seen with what you really can do. Uh, in Wake County, which is where, county where I'm from, there is a K-12 STEM collaborative network of about 25 schools. And it's in its infancy. We're one of the lead schools with respect to that. And I know I've already touched maybe half a dozen elementary schools and three or four middle schools in terms of presenting how the grand challenges can be used. I mean, you can talk about access to clean water in sixth grade. I mean, they, they know what that drought is. They know what water is. They know what pollution is. Uh, so you can do some of these things regardless of what age. And, and again, going back to the engineering design model, I, I mean, I think that's really important because you're talking about a way of thinking about things. So you're asking a question. You're imagining, what can I do? Then you plan what you're going to do and you create whatever it is, and then you look at it and is, does this answer the question? Does this answer the ask? You can do this at the elementary age. So I think it's a matter of sharing, it's a matter of collaboration among K-12 schools. Thank you. Okay, so our final questioner. Sebastian Jollis for Olin College as well. Um, if I may summarize a little bit, it seems like the panel is mostly in agreement that uh, project-based learning is the way to go and there's intrinsic motivation and all these nice things. Um, and some of the solutions or approaches that have been discussed, um, it seems like may reach more of a privileged audience. So for example, uh, even through uh, MOOCs, massively open online courses, I'm not sure that there's uh, that they are immediately going to be project-based and that they, they will be able to reach uh, an under or unprivileged audience. So I'm wondering what the panel's thoughts on reaching those audiences are, even with those pedagogical techniques. Thank you. Can I nominate you, John, to uh, yeah, address that one? Uh, Dean may want to say something because I think that's another approach. I, I, I think we um, MOOCs are part of the solution. Obviously, you're trying to teach project-based learning. We're going to have to do something else. But remember, this is the early days. We have lots of new online technology being developed. It's just started. Watch what will happen. Imagine, I, within a year, I guarantee, just as you've had you have reading clubs around the country where people get together and read books. You'll have self-assembling learning communities where people will get together. The course material will be there. If there's a project-based component, you could even think about how do you get their hands on a project-based component? How do you get a first thing there and, and get something there? How can Dean reach a school where perhaps he, he can't get the mentors by using some online technology? I think we're going to see lots of creative things happen in this world, and that, that's what's really going to change it. Thank you very much. I, th I think uh, we probably should bring this session to a close. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking all our panelists for a very interesting session. <laughs>